The patrons have spoken, and now we have Kingler. This king crab is a longtime fan favorite, having been around since Generation 1. Ash's Krabby evolved into one during his first round battle in the Indigo Plateau, aka the Anime Glory Days. Speaking of Indigo League and the wonders of anime logic, Kingler appeared in the episode The Battle of the Badge, where it lost to an Arcanine, but it beat a Bulbasaur. Finally, Kingler owns the popular fast food restaurant, The Krusty Krab, zealously guarding the Krabby Patty formula. Get it? Because it evolves from Krabby. It all fits, obviously. Anyway, today we'll be examining if Kingler and its big, meaty claws were able to find success in the competitive scene. And so, we ask, how good was Kingler actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. While Kingler isn't a Gen 1 OU staple, it has a small but highly dangerous niche in the tier. Yes, it had a terrible special stat alongside low HP and a middling speed tier, meaning it was easy prey for common Pokemon like Starmie and Alakazam. However, it was worth using in a serious setting with some paralysis support, because if the other team was slowed down, then it was a terror. It had Swords Dance and the highest attack stat of any Swords Dance user by far. This let it pose a massive threat with boosted Hyper Beams. It cleanly one hit KO Chansey and Alakazam after a dance, and if its nemesis Starmie was paralyzed, which was a common occurrence, it KO'd it from full health 30% of the time. And that was a worst case scenario, as the damage roll was 89% minimum, meaning it only took the slightest chip for Starmie to be in KO range. Plus, thanks to the way Boost interacted with Paralysis, Kingler didn't necessarily need to risk the roll against a full HP Starmie. Here's how it worked. If a healthy Kingler used Source Dance as a full HP paralyzed Starmie switched in, and then use Body Slam as Starmie used Thunder Wave, since Kingler's stats were boosted, it would actually be faster than Starmie even though both were paralyzed and Starmie was naturally faster. Thus, it could safely go for the two-hit KO with Body Slam. Anyways, back to Kingler's main claim to fame, plus two Hyper Beam. Kingler didn't one-hit KO much else with it, but it doled out an absolute ton of damage, and things didn't tend to stay at full health throughout a RBY game. It wasn't meant to boost up against a full health team, it was meant to boost up against a weakened, paralyzed team and finish them off. For example, a Swords Dance Hyper Beam did 73 to 86% to Executor, which is an absolute ton considering how often Executor is chipped, often by opposing Executor. Kingler didn't even need Executor to be paralyzed because it outsped it naturally, making it even more dangerous. Doing 64 to 76% to Snorlax was similarly impressive, while it did similar damage to Lapras, another decently fast Pokemon who Kingler also naturally outsped. Also worth noting is that at plus two, Kingler would beat Tauros one on one. Now you might be thinking, well, most Pokemon in RBY can threaten Kingler. For example, if Chansey Thunder Waves it, it's ruined. So where did Kingler get that all important turn to set up its Swords Dance? Well, the answer is against the omnipresent Reflect Snorlax that had been forced to rest. But wait, how was Kingler meant to break through Reflect Lax's defense boost? Even multiple Swords Dances wouldn't make it strong enough. The answer lay in Kingler's signature move, Crab Hammer, which, thanks to RBY mechanics, was was a guaranteed critical hit. Well, 255 times out of 256 anyway. And thus made up for Kingler's miserable special stat. This allowed it to attack Snorlax on the special side, three hit KOing it and thus threatening it out, allowing it to grab that Swords Dance and wreak havoc. Crab Hammer was also crucial because it one hit KO'd Rhydon and Golem, two of the three Pokemon in OU that actually resisted Hyper Beam. The third was Gengar, whose high special meant it took pittance from even crit Crab Hammers. But Gengar was a frail lead who loved to use explosive so by the time Kingler came out, it would be gone. All in all, one had to be careful when using Kingler due to its low speed and frailty, but with the right support and aggressive play, it could slice through OU teams like little else, and that made its niche legitimate to the point where it saw success in high-level tournaments. Now, as a result of being niche in OU, Kingler was UU, but it was pretty much completely unviable there, thanks to the tier being even more populated by Pokemon it couldn't handle as a result of its low speed and special, like Dragonite, Electrix, Haunter, Kadabra, and more. However, seeing as it had a niche in OU, it was a fine trade-off to make. So let's just remember Kingler at its best, with boosted hyper beings blasting through paralyzed Starmie. The second generation crippled Kingler hard. With the Hyper Beam nerf, Kingler was now a Swords Dancer without any good physical moves. At best, it had Return or Double Edge. At least it could now improve its coverage with Hidden Power, but it still didn't hit nearly hard enough to justify its miserable bulk. Especially since Crab Hammer was no longer an automatic crit either. It wasn't able to make any sort of impact on OU or UU, instead dropping to NU. There, however, it was one of the tier's premier Pokemon. NU was a lot frailer and slower than the above tiers. 
so Kingler and its plus two double edges were able to cleave through stall teams with ease. It wasn't instantly ruined by status or various chip damage either, as it could rest up, burn sleep turns on the many top tier Pokemon it staved off, such as Dugong, and come back for another assault. It generally found plenty of opportunities against many common Pokemon in the tier, especially if it traded in rest for Surf, allowing it to threaten even more Pokemon immediately, i.e. without needing to use a turn on Swords Dance, such as Graveler and Rhyhorn. This made it a great attacker on a game-to-game -game basis, especially since the only faster Pokemon in the tier that threatened to actually two-hit KO it in return were Zatu and Magmar, neither of which were too keen on taking Double Edge. Since most of its switch-ins were slower, that meant that they were vulnerable to getting run over once Kingler grabbed the Swords Dance, and they had not remained sufficiently healthy, which could be tough when weathering repeated hits, especially with spikes down. For example, Weezing was Kingler's best overall check, but it had to consciously stay healthy enough so that Kingler didn't blow by it with a plus two HP ground. Kingler also had some set variety. In addition to the changes it could make on its main SD set, it could also run a Source Dance Rest Talker to remain threatening even while asleep. Giving up coverage was unfortunate, but nothing that couldn't be made up for with team support, and the ability to sleep talk a boosted return made it even more difficult to play around for many teams that relied on forcing it to rest before being able to threaten it. Finally, Kingler was of course one of the tier's best offensive threats, but it also had excellent defensive utility. Its huge defense stat allowed it to stave off some of the tier's best physical attackers, such as Dugtrio and the Rock types, while not fearing hits from other strong Pokemon like Primeape and Fearow. Overall, Kingler was one of the best, most dangerous Pokemon in GSC and U. And make no mistake, Kingler was never part of Gen 3 OU. But we must mention that some players experimented with it ever so briefly since it had access to knockoff, which speaks more to the power of removing leftovers even when it wasn't an offensive tool, especially in a permanent sandstorm environment. With high defense investment and hidden power fighting, it could beat Tyranitar one on one. Of course, its 15 milliseconds of fame didn't last once it was realized that it was entirely outclassed in every possible way by Hariyama, but at least a glimpse OU play, even if it was only a tiny bit, which was more than most Pokemon could claim. Kingler confronted itself with this thought as it plummeted to NU once again, especially because it was no longer one of the tier's best Pokemon. In fact, it wasn't very good at all. Now, it did have good qualities. It loved the addition of Choice Band, as that allowed it to become a truly brutal immediate threat alongside its huge attack stat. It could also try to clean teams up by going the setup route. In addition to Swords Dance, it could make use of the new Select Berry to bypass its meager speed stat, and when combined with Endure or Substitute, it could reliably drop itself to 1 HP, getting the speed boost and jacking its flail up to 200 base power, meaning that if it managed to grab a Source Dance along the way, it would in theory outrun and one-hit KO everything on the opposing team, except of course, Haunter and Shedinja, who dropped to Hidden Power Ghost. Finally, it could fit in on stall teams using its knockoff to remove opposing teams' leftovers, and thus accelerate their collapse under the pressure of the residual damage. This all sounded good on paper, but didn't work out nearly as well in practice. Its choice band set was too slow to be a truly effective wall breaker and struggled with coverage since it could only run one type of hidden power at a time. Without Ghost, it was useless against Haunter, but without Ground, Mawile would eat it alive. The Flail set had similar coverage troubles, except it was even worse off for it since it was supposed to be an all-in sweeper. At least the choice band set could attempt to use chip damage and sheer power throughout a game to overwhelm checks like Mawile, Relicanth, and Tangela. The defensive set was an alright physical wall and knockoff was great, but it was hardly an essential Pokemon. Of course, in the right hands, Kingler could be quite effective. A base 130 attack choice bander could potentially break huge holes in a team. Swords Dance to Lackberry Flail could potentially end entire games, and the defensive set could potentially be incredibly irritating to deal with. However, note the key word, potentially. Kingler was the opposite of a plug-in and play Pokemon. It required a ton of support in the team building department, and top-notch play to make the most out of it in battle. This sort of high maintenance could make for frustrating teams and battles, so many players didn't bother. It wasn't necessarily a bad Pokemon, but there were many Pokemon in Advanced NU that were a lot easier to achieve consistent results with, and thus were used over Kingler more often than not. The fourth generation introduced the physical special split, which was an enormous blessing, as it meant Kingler could actually use physical stab. Of course, this wasn't anywhere near enough to vault it into OU, where Gyarados was tearing everything up. UU also remained beyond Kingler's reach thanks to the plethora of grass types and superior competition once again, this time in the form of Feraligator. But that was fine because surely Kingler would dominate NU once again, right? Especially because Heart Gold and Soul Silver gave it agility to bypass its speed. Unfortunately, 
unfortunately, that didn't quite happen. And at an initial glance, it might seem puzzling as to why. Regirock and Sandslash were the tier's best, most common physical walls, and they were unable to thwart Kingler's mighty crab hammer. And it didn't seem like Kingler had any real competition. However, over time, players just didn't use Kingler, and the reason slowly became apparent. It did have physical water type competition, just not of the setup variety, because it certainly wasn't getting outdone by Wish Cash. No, the reason Kingler wasn't used was because of Floatzel. Now, Floatzel could never hope to match Kingler's power, but it more than made up for that with its other qualities. It had absolutely incredible speed, which meant it was able to threaten a much wider variety of Pokemon right off the bat without a need for a setup turn, most notably against Charizard, the best Pokemon in NU. It also packs several other great tools such as Taunt to toy with walls, but Taunt Pass to maintain easy, safe momentum and bulk up to either threaten the sweep itself or pass those boosts off to teammates. It was much better against the metagame and thus much easier to fit on a team and use in a battle than Kingler was. To make matters worse, it wasn't the only water type that generally outperformed Kingler. Polyrath was quite a bit better too. Kingler wasn't bad, but it was tough to get the most out of when one could simply use a different water type that was more effective against the DPP and you metagame, and Kingler was often forgotten. Generation 5's Dream World gifted Kingler an amazing ability in sheer force, which would catapult it to new levels of power. But in a cruel twist of fate, Kingler couldn't even make use of it, because for some truly bizarre reason, it didn't learn Waterfall, which would have received the 30% power boost. Crabhammer lacked a secondary effect, so sheer force didn't boost it, and Kingler was unable to escape its barren barrow of sub-mediocrity. Even if Crabhammer was boosted by sheer force, it's unlikely it would have been able to impact OU and UU, given how many faster offensive water types there were, and when it comes to offense, faster is often better. However, it still would have been nice for it to have something. It likely would have been able to compete and outclass Crawdon in RU, seeing as Crawdon was a massive threat in the tier and Kingler was significantly faster, while its higher attack would have made it stronger in conjunction with sheer force. Alas, instead of being a genuine RU threat, Kingler was doomed to NU once again. It wasn't easy for it there either, as there was plenty of terrific offensive water type competition. Between Samurats, superior move pull, and resulting set versatility, Karakasa's shell smash, and Ludicolo and Seismitoad's swift swim abuse, Kingler had a difficult time distinguishing itself significantly enough to make players willing to overlook its awful, easily exploitable special bulk. However, it wasn't all bad for Kingler. It was actually decently fast for the tier, naturally outspeeding Samurai and Ludicolo, and being able to threaten much of the metagame. Its abysmal special bulk would require carefully measured aggressive play to get it on the field safely, but once it pulled that off, very little was going to enjoy switching in, especially since it could completely turn the tables on goal to wall Aloma Mola with a substitute Source Dance set. If we're frank, Kingler probably didn't deserve its untiered placement, because yeah, that's where it wound up. It should have been explored more than it was, and if it had, it probably would have been found to be quite decent. Who knows, if Black and White NU had lasted longer, it might have very well established itself as a good Pokemon. Now, it's unlikely it would have measured up to Samurott and Friends' widespread viability that made them so easy to slap on teams, but it almost almost surely would have found some sort of legitimate use. It's the smallest of small comforts, but at least this time around, Kingler's lack of usage wasn't its own fault. Generation 6 gave Kingler a new offensive weapon in the form of a significantly buffed knockoff, which made it even more of a threat on the offensive side. Unfortunately, its many notable defensive shortcomings remained and were as exploitable as ever. However, Gen 6 helped Kingler out beyond just giving it a new move. It gave it a new tier below NU where Kingler could finally be a legitimate threat once more. It still had offensive water type competition, but in PU, Kingler was as dangerous as anything. Sure, some of those other waters could claim to approach its power. Power. Gorbis and Huntail had Shell Smash, and Relicanth packed a meaty stab head smash, Sans Recoil thanks to Rockhead. However, Kingler was much faster than them, and in conjunction with its vastly superior instant power, it had a ton of opportunity to immediately threaten a much wider variety of Pokemon, without the need of a free turn to grab a boost. Plus, its access to knockoff allowed it to guarantee it crippled the opposing team. Now, Simipore was far faster than Kingler, but it couldn't come close to matching Kingler's strength. All this came together to ensure that Kingler was never close to being outclassed. Its low special defense would always be a hindrance in some capacity, but it's always had its own niche, that of being both decently fast and skull-crushingly powerful, all while removing the opponent's crucial leftovers and eviolites without easing up on the offensive throttle. It could be played in several different ways too. Either it could be used as a bruiser to open up huge holes in the opponent's defenses, allowing a teammate to clean up more easily, or it could go for a late-game agility sweep to do the cleaning up itself. Kingler still had its flaws, but it was almost 
both peerless in its damage output and ability to dish out that damage to begin with. As a result, it was an overall solid Oraz PU Pokemon. Generation 7 gave Kingler what it had been dreaming for since Gen 5, a physical water move with a secondary effect, meaning it was boosted by sheer force and no longer took life or recoil when using it. It would have been content with Waterfall, but it received Liquidation instead, which was even stronger. It was absolutely monstrous coming off of Kingler's sky-high attack and the double boost from sheer force and life orb. It didn't end there though. Kingler also received more coverage in the form of Stomping Tantrum, allowing it to hit even more Pokemon super Super effectively and thus making it even more of a threat. It returned to PU with a vengeance and absolutely terrorized the tier. Stomping Tantrum allowed it to plow through would-be checks like Lantern and Quillfish, while thanks to Sheer Force and Life Orb, it could even use Ice Beam in spite of its low special attack, narrowing down its list of checks even further. No longer could Altaria, Tangela, Gorgas XL, or Alolan Exeggutor check it, as they were all two hit KO'd. As for Liquidation, well, it absolutely vaporized anything neutral to it, and most resist didn't like switching into it either, even something as bulky as Silvali Dragon. This meant Kingler was a wall breaker extraordinaire, but that wasn't the only thing it could do. It could also double as a terrific sweeper, with agility, without giving up its wall breaking ability since it really only needed those three moves. It was a terrifying Pokemon that the tier struggled to fend off. Even if teams didn't lose to Kingler outright, they would still have an enormous hole ripped in their defensive core, and would be easy pickings for Kingler's teammates such as Pyroar. It was a brutally oppressive presence, and thus the metagame player base voted to ban Kingler to PUBL, and it was unable to replicate the success in NU. But that was more than fine, because for the first time ever, Kingler was too powerful to be allowed in a tier. That's the dream for most Pokemon. For the first time ever, Kingler was viable in RU during Sword and Shield, pre-DLC. It was niche, but its double dance set is able to choose whether it wants the Swords Dance up to break open a more defensive team with plus two knockoff destroying common water resist like Jellicent and Vaporeon, or if it wants to agility to sweep past a more offensive team with Liquidation, being just as much of an auto KO button against neutral targets as it was in the previous generation. However, with the DLC's expanded pool of Pokemon, Kingler dropped to NU, where it remains at the time of this video. The metagame is still developing and is likely to change drastically once again with the next DLC, but currently, Kingler's double dance set remains threatening for the same reasons as it was in RU. However, players are exploring alternate options for it, such as superpower to lure and destroy Ferrocy and deal heavy damage to Polyrath. Knockoff is incredibly threatening to all the Pokemon that rely on heavy duty boots, and removing leftovers is always useful for making it tougher for the Pokemon reliant on them to check Kingler's offensive teammates. Plus, with no Z crystals around, there's no way to absorb knockoff besides with Sticky Hold Gastrodon, but Sticky Hold Gastrodon doesn't have Storm Drain and thus drops to Liquidation. Speaking of which, Kingler is such a threat because sometimes it's as simple as using Liquidation and watching things drop. Again, the metagame might change, but it's hard to imagine Kingler not tearing up PU again. And who knows, it might be legit in NU this time around. And before we end, I'm sure some of you are wondering about Gigantamax Kingler. Yeah, well... Dynamax slash Gigantamax is banned in the Smogan format. And as for VGC for Kingler specifically, uh, yeah, no GMAX Kingler or regular Kingler or whatever has ever top cut it at a regional level or higher tournament. Probably because there are lots of better Gigantamaxes and, well, regular Pokemon to use over Kingler. At least at the time of this video. C'est la vie. And that's it, so how good was Kingler actually? Well, it started off with the niche, in the paragon of exclusivity that is RBYOU, since it was the strongest user of Source Dance, ironically being far better in that tier than in the UU below it. It was hit hard by the subsequent generation's Hyper Beam nerf, but became one of the most vicious Pokemon in GSC NU. After that, it fell on hard times for quite a while. From generations 3 through 5 of NU, it was mediocre at best. However, Gen 6 came around and introduced PU, where Kingler found new life. Gen 7 gave it liquidation, the sheer force boosted stab move it had been craving, and for the first time ever, it was too good for a tier, getting banned to PUBL. Gen 8 has seen it breach RU viability for the first time, and though that didn't last thanks to the DLC, it has been legitimate in NU as well. Now who knows if that'll last with the next round of DLC additions, but it's sure to rip PU apart again, and with the smaller Pokedex, it might just sneak its way back into NU for real. Thanks for watching everyone, and as always, 
if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to Fall Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about Competitive Kingler? How would you change it to make it go beyond NU or RU? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. Also, thank you so much to our patrons for voting for this Pokemon and for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.